This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 786, recorded on July 27th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 86 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 30 Celsius. And so it's just plain hot. There's mm -hmm. sort of wispy clouds, um, but the weather app just shows sun. It's 32C here. Uh, the, the weather says sunny, but it's mostly white puffy clouds. But I'm not complaining. The, today, outside, we have this little mall in front of the building. They actually gave away free ice cream for everybody to treat wow. everyone. Isn't that funny? Nice. <laughs> Little cups of Ben and mm -hmm. Jerry's. That was fun. Mm -hmm. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Um, great to see you. It's uh, 92 degrees. So I would say a typical July Austin day. Uh, it was sunny when I was out in the garden earlier, much earlier, um, uh, but it uh, seems to have clouded up. I would like to elaborate a little bit by saying that when I got up this morning, it was at 6 a.m., it was uh, 71 degrees and 100% humidity, mm -hmm. 2.71, okay? But it was perfectly, my wife and I took a walk. It was uh, perfectly, uh, perfectly reasonable now. The dew point's gone down to 67. It's 43% humidity. You know, could be worse. I'm I'm more or less kind of used to this. I have to say that we were in Oregon for the heat wave that went through the Pacific Northwest. And in the high desert near Bend, uh, it got over 100 degrees uh, for several days. Uh, but even on the worst of those days, it cools down to 60 at night. Mm -hmm. And on a typical day, you know, I had days when it was up uh, mid 80s. And when I got up in the morning, it was 40 and the and the humidity is like five percent, something like that. So different climate, uh, and delightful during the summer. But um, uh, I'll visit during a winter and go skiing, and that's about it. So you drove there. You you hung out in Oregon for a while, then you drove back. Is that right? Yeah, we took about eight days to drive there, uh, okay. visiting uh, Grand Canyon and Grant McFadden and relatives. Drove uh, straight out to California and then uh, up. Uh, up uh, California, and then we stayed there for about uh, three weeks, during which time um, two-thirds of my family, both my daughters and their families, came out and spent some time. And my wife and I celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary, and that was nice. Hmm. Uh, and then we hung out uh, for a total of about three weeks and then drove back by a different route. Took about five days. We drove more or less straight east or east-southeast down to Fort Collins and then down uh, through Rocky Mountain National Park and then uh, home from there. Nice. 50 years. Congratulations. Thank you. Wow, you're way ahead of us. <laughs> I start, We started early. Also joining us is from Madison, New Jersey, Brian Barker. Hi. Um, pretty similar here. 91 Fahrenheit. Uh, still pretty sunny. Um, and congratulations, Rich. Thank you. Are you still doing summer lab uh, stuff, Brian? Uh, Friday was our last day. Cool. Um, so it is now uh, get ready for classes time. When um, do they start? They start uh, August 30th. Hmm. And today they are actually painting my apartment, so I can't go outside. I'm painted in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I don't actually know how humid it is, but it looks lovely. <laughs> I have two more weeks in my virology, summer virology course, and, um, and then a final, and then we're done till the spring. That'll be good. All right. We have two papers for you today. Uh, the first is about respiratory syncytial virus. This is a, this is a Med Archive preprint, and um, I've tried to steer away from preprints lately, but this one is... It is, you know, counting cases in a little genome sequencing. I figured it would probably be published in close to this form. Uh, Off-season RSV epidemics in Australia after easing of COVID-19 restrictions. This is a topic we've talked about a lot about how 
um, some other respiratory infections have been curtailed, and then all of a sudden they have, have increased afterwards. So I thought this would be of interest. Uh, so this is from a variety of uh, institutions in Australia, as you might guess. So we have shared co-first authors, John Sebastian Eden, Chisa Sikazwe, and Rupang Zhi. And then we also have co-senior authorship. Uh, we have... Um, those are the pound signs. We have Vijay Krishna, Dana Sakaran, David Smith, Jen Cock, and Ian Barr, and the Australian RSV Study Group. Whew. And of course, we have uh, talked recently about respiratory syncytial virus. They have a great. So I'm Go ahead. Go I'm ready to give the summary if you want. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So basically, uh, during the pandemic, as Vincent indicated, uh, we've sort of paid attention to some extent to other respiratory viruses. And in the case of respiratory syncytial virus, widespread infections occurred, but they occurred out of season in Australia. They were offset by about six to nine months uh, coming later than usual. That's the That's summary. summary. Cool. So the, the, the factoids are good because sometimes we don't, present these. And 3.2 million hospital admissions, 118,000 deaths a year in children under five years of age, mostly low and middle income countries. I didn't actually know it was mostly low and middle income countries. And it's also significant for all age groups. Reinfection can occur throughout life, particularly the elder and immunocompromised can get severe infection like influenza would do that. And it, the virus causes seasonal epidemics in both tropical and temperate regions. In Australia, uh, they the temperate regions, they have both tropical and temperate regions in Australia. Uh, temperate regions have their outbreaks uh, during the autumn and winter, which for them is June, July. <laughs> and in the more tropical northern parts, Interestingly, the activity correlates with rainfall and humidity from December to March. That's very interesting, isn't it? Because totally different weather patterns, and I wonder um, how that impacts the seasonality. And um, it, go ahead. Getting to your point about um, it being more of a problem in the developing countries, I think that's because uh, they don't have as good of supportive care. Sure, yeah. Yeah, but we do have it here as well. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. yes, yes, we do. Uh, All right. I want to. I want to very quickly do. So, uh, correct me if I get this wrong. Respiratory syncytial virus, uh, negative strand enveloped virus, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess we've uh, at least alluded to this. This is a nasty critter. Okay, that puts a lot of kids in the hospital mm -hmm. um, and uh, does not confer durable immunity so that people get reinfected throughout their lifetime. Uh, and as immunity uh, sort of in old guys like me, as immunity sort of declines uh, when you're older, that's another high risk uh, period as well. And we have not been able to come up with uh, a vaccine that's uh, safe and effective. Um, and so this is, a, I mean, to me, when I, th when I think about COVID, I, I think about, you know, this is in some ways, once we get through <laughs> the initial COVID thing, uh, this is kind of COVID's future, I think, um, is this, Nasty, except that COVID doesn't have really all that nasty an infection in infants, whereas this does. Yeah, yeah. and I, I gotta say, this isn't pleasant um, as an adult who is not in one of those high risk groups either. Um, I had, I have what I assume was an RSV infection about two years ago, seeing as how I was playing with a friend's child who then was hospitalized with RSV, um, and it wasn't very fun. It wasn't like I went to the hospital or anything like that, but. You know, I was in bed for a while, so mm. not something anybody really wants. Right. So this is a nasty, nasty uh, critter. And I uh, 
to me, this would be on the top of my list for an mRNA vaccine. And I'm interested to see what the future will bring in that regard. I'm sure we'll see it, yeah. At there least is, test it. There is, a, a, for very high-risk children, a protective uh, antibody that can be given passively. Mm -hmm. yep. But it's really expensive and yep. only in high-risk cases. Yep. Uh, so as Kathy mentioned, in, in Australia, the non-pharmaceutical interventions suppressed uh, not only SARS-CoV-2, but influenza virus and RSV circulation. They didn't have any winter epidemics during 2020. And what's interesting is though that the different parts of the country had different patterns, as you will see. Uh, so the impact was not consistent across all the viruses though. Uh, rhinoviruses continued to circulate and, and to some extent adenoviruses uh, also continued to circulate, which is really interesting, right? Some viruses are interrupted and, and some don't. Uh, this was also seen, these patterns of suppression were also seen in South Africa, New Zealand, um, and other countries as well in the US um, as well. And then there were rebounds later on, out of season spikes. So in 2020, uh, they were rather severe out of season RSV spikes in several Australian states and territories, uh, New South Wales, the Australian Capital Territory, NSW, ACT, Western Australia, WA, Victoria had outbreaks throughout this past summer. And so the, the purpose of this paper was to try and understand what was going on there. Uh, because as, as I said before 2020, the activity consistently began in the mid-autumn, persisted for six months with a peak in the middle of July, the winter. But in 2020, it was six to nine months later. So, uh, so the weird thing about this paper, it's not necessarily, we've, as you've said, we've already talked about how the uh, non NPIs, right? Non-pharmaceutical mm -hmm. interventions, behavioral modification, uh, masks and a distancing and et cetera, uh, has suppressed a number of different uh, infections uh, during the course of COVID. So that's not, that's not novel. What's weird is that this thing came back out of season, Yes. Okay. So that speaks to the whole idea of what is seasonality. Okay. And uh, uh, there are more questions here than answers, but it's an interesting observation. Yeah. Well, we'll have some suggestions uh, at the end here. So just to give you an idea of what they did uh, <clears throat> in Australia, so non NPIs included limits on international arrivals, quarantine requirements, 14 days, internal border closing, social distancing, physical distancing, school closures, or at least telling parents to keep their children home, hygiene protocols. Um, but as they say, which is relevant to RSV, child care centers mostly remained open during this restriction. And uh, before these measures were put in place, there was a gradual increase in RSV activity in early 2020, and then the introduction of, of the NPIs for COVID then precipitated a rapid decline uh, in incidents in each of the states, which uh, was, was basically mirrored by laboratory confirmed uh, RSV numbers. Um, then later in 2020 and early 2021, there were subsequent epidemics, uh, which they say exceeded or equivalent to or exceeded the normal winter seasonal activity uh, seen any of the previous years. And for New South Wales, uh, that began in September 2020 with two peaks, uh, which they think reflected inconsistent testing over the holiday period. Uh, and then for, they also, they saw a December 2020 peak in, in ACT and also uh, for R WA, the peak began in late September and pe peaked in December. And they, they, you know, the stringency of these restrictions varied, as I said, over the different territories, uh, in, in, in with time. And they think this contribute to uh, the different patterns that they're seeing, like a, a three month delay. Uh, in in Victoria, there was a wa second wave of COVID from July to August 2020, so they had a longer lockdown period, which they think delayed RSV by three months and so forth. And these peaks were greater in magnitude than the normal seasonality, correct? Yeah, equal to or exceeded, that's right. Right. 
And there's a nice figure one, which yeah. uh, you can see, which has uh, all the timelines. They have a, a line of uh, RSV positivity, and then they have in the background, um, they have lines as to, you know, return to school, full return to school, closing up, <laughs> relaxation of border. So there's one figure, relaxation of border restrictions and boom, RSV yeah. uh, goes mm -hmm. up. It's quite interesting. So they, this the first part of this paper, they do uh, whole genome sequencing on positive specimens, mostly from young children. There are two subtypes of RSV, A and B, and they say they have both been in Australia historically. Uh, they co-circulate in shifting but relatively even prevalence. Um, this continued in the pre-COVID period, but in late from late 2020 to early 2021, there was an overwhelming predominance of the RSVA subtype, which greater than 95% for all the states. And so they say, well, this suggests that these might have been responsible for the, the late 2020 outbreaks as well as the surge in uh, early 2021. Um, and then they do some phylogenetic analysis. Uh, these RSVA viruses uh, belong to a genotype first reported in Canada in 2010. And they have become predominant, not just globally, but also, well, globally, and then re reintroduced uh, into Australia. Um, and the, the viruses from the post-COVID period have two lineages, one associated with New South Wales and ACT, the other uh, WA, and so different parts of the country, different lineages. And you can distinguish these lineages by certain uh, changes in the genome. They see these changes in the glycoprotein, nucleocapsid, some of the other proteins, whereas the uh, New South Wales uh, changes were interestingly a bunch of amino acid changes in the C terminus of the glycoprotein, and they say these have not been previously reported. So that's kind of interesting that you have an out of season outbreak and it's a really different virus, at least in terms of the spike. Um, so they basically believe that um, uh, the, the rising in cases in early 2021 was associated with multiple importations of that. Uh, lineage rather than emergence of a novel, uh, another novel lineage. They think it was always there and they just didn't see it before and it just somehow got amplified. Um, they, they compare these sequences to a global database. Um, these don't, the, the viruses from Australia don't really cluster with any others that have been sampled. Um, and um, they can't rule out that uh, so the, this lineage that they ob observe. So the, the RSVA predominated, as I said. Uh, the RSVB, far fewer uh, isolations. Um, and mostly unsim not similar to previous lineages. So basically they say, this, these illustrate a remarkable collapse in the genetic diversity of RSV in Australia during the implementation of COVID-related restrictions. And they do speculate quite a bit on where these novel lineages came from, but you know, two, two hypotheses. One is that they were there already, and the other that they were introduced from somewhere else, but they can't really uh, distinguish that between the two of those. So I think that's quite interesting that you restrict the transmission by these interventions, and then when it comes back, it's, it's different and restrict, genetically restricted. Right. Yeah, it almost sounds it. You know, it feels to me not that I know much about this, but it almost feels to me like a a founder effect. Yeah, emerging from sure the the suppression of it. You know, that a couple of you know for no particular reason other than that they're there, a couple of uh, strains get a foothold. Yeah, and and take over. And when there's so little virus around for them to compete against, yeah, they do particularly well. Yeah, and then maybe as we go forward, we'll see changes as there's more competition. Yeah, so or, you yeah. know, uh, uh, reestablish the old equilibrium of strains. I'm sure they'll keep their eye on it. That's an interesting question. Yeah, going forward, is this a is this a uh, a, a new pattern that going forward, or will we reestablish sort yeah. of the old balance? So that's the um, yeah. So as Rich said, these are two lineages that they haven't seen before, but 
they say it must be cryptic circulation and everything else was eliminated through the, through the COVID related. And I, and I think that's, that makes sense that it was just one of them was there and it, it emerged and that's why it's, it's prevalent now. Um, so that, this is an interesting um, example of how you, you can use this opportunity to understand how RSV uh, epidemics occur and, and particularly how they can quickly rebound and these are unseasonal epidemics. And one of the ideas they have is that maybe the NPI period increased the number of, of children susceptible, right? Because they would normally be getting infected, probably a lot of them uh, asymptomatically, and then give them some kind of immunity. And then without that, now you have a big outbreak, right? And that may have part of the, that be maybe part of the reason why it was out of season. I think if you have enough population susceptibility, seasonality goes out the window. Right. That's, that, <laughs> right. That, that makes sense to me. Yeah. So, I mean, we, when I think about seasonality, I often think about sort of parameters in terms of humidity or temperature. Um, and I also think about behaviors like when you're in school and when you're not. But this also points out that sort of the dynamics of the population's immune responses are probably also a piece of that seasonality puzzle. Yeah. In tw 2009, when uh, H1N1 influenza began its pandemic. It was totally out of season, if you remember. It's like some late summer or something like that. And I think that's the same idea. You have a big susceptible population. Now, they say here that this, so we delayed the age at first infection for, for a lot of kids. And so they say, well, that should give rise to fewer hospitalizations, right? But that, that wasn't what they saw in at least bronchiolitis admissions. They were actually higher in, in certain places in Australia than, than pre prior seasons. So they say, you know, just because you delay it doesn't mean that the outbreak uh, is going to be less severe. Well, and, and they also point out, you know, if you look back at figure one, the outbreak was also larger. So yeah. it's a little bit of a difficult comparison yeah. to make because there were more infections as well. They, they say uh, it remains unclear how long it will take for normal winter RSV seasonality to resume. And they point out, which I did not know, the H1N1 2009 flu pandemic impacted respiratory virus circulation for a number of years. I didn't know that. I wasn't paying attention to that at the time. But I found uh, that interesting too. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we'll see. It'll probably be a while, but... COVID pandemic's not over yet, so <laughs> we will have to uh, wait till that's done to see what's going to happen. So COVID uh, pandemics like this one that where you have to do NPIs, they can impact other circulations and they can rebound sometimes in a weird time and, and sometimes with more cases and so forth. So I think that's a nice lesson from this study um, that we, we, we've we seen now quantified where we've kind of talked about it casually. So. Yeah, and you remember that last year there was concern about there being a twin demic of um, SARS-CoV-2 and influenza, and that that didn't pan out. But you know that doesn't mean that it couldn't still happen. Yeah, you know, as yeah. Uh, we get more people vaccinated to SARS-CoV-2, then maybe something will happen with respect to influenza. Right, because maybe, you know, we didn't have as many people getting subclinical infections and having that sort of same immune response issue here. Hope not. That would be bad. All right. Uh, the second paper is a journal pre-proof uh, from Cell. And uh, that means it's got all kinds of writing horizontal, uh, diagonally <laughs> on all the darn pages, which makes it hard to highlight. But I found, I did find though, I opened it in Acrobat and I delete all those uh, angular types and it helps me highlight, which is, which may seem to be an excessive thing to do, but, um, you know, I, I, sometimes you can't highlight a word without highlighting that whole thing on the page, right? So this is called lo Impaired Local Intrinsic Immunity to SARS-CoV-2 Infection in Severe COVID-19. Uh, this is from a large group of people all over the place, Boston, uh, Massachusetts, Mississippi, 
I guess mostly Massachusetts and a few yeah, Mississippi. Yeah, several different uh, several different institutions in Massachusetts: Harvard, and MIT, and uh, I think a, a medical center in there. But the samples were collected in Mississippi, and that's how they creep in. All right, so we have. Um, do we have co-first co -first authors? authors? Do six. we? Yeah. Seven or six? Six. Ziegler, Zig Meow, Owings, Navia, Tang, Bromley. Okay, and, and we have co-PIs also or senior. Four. <laughs> that would be. So that's. Sh go ahead. Sh yeah, Shalik, Glover, Horwitz, and Ordovas Montanes. Okay. Um, so this is uh, addressing number of interesting issues, but uh, one of them that I think is cool is that some clues, which we've had from other studies, but this is a nice addition. W why some people get mild COVID and others get more, more severe COVID starts to really shed some light on that. Um, and as you know, you're initially infected in the nasopharynx and um, you shed virus there and you transmit it for there. And, and then Subsequently, you can have a wide range of outcomes from mild symptoms to severe disease with pneumonia, acute respiratory distress, and systemic inflammation and so forth. So what's the difference between all these individuals? And there's been some some clues before, and this is a good way to summarize those and, and take it a little further. So, so are, do we think everyone's clear on what intrinsic immunity is from the oh, title? Oh, I wanted and how to that, say that. <laughs> no. How that is compared to other types of immunity? I, yeah. Go for it, Brian. Good idea. I don't think that's the right name, actually, but you tell us. So uh, I hear about intrinsic immunity more among virologists than immunologists. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so my understanding of intrinsic immunity, the way I define it, is that it is the way that the infected cell defends itself. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is sort of the infected cells uh, methods of defense. And so you could think of it as, you know, restriction factors or other sorts of things that virologists might think about yeah, where the, yeah. the infected cell blocks infection. Right. Um, and that sort of differs from things like barrier immunity that keeps a virus out or innate immunity that. Um, mm -hmm. You froze up, Brian. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> She'll be back, I, I, I presume. So yeah. to expand a little bit on the intrinsic ones, looking up the definition in your uh, textbook, Vincent, uh, the responses that are considered intrinsic are things like apoptosis, autophagy, and RNA interference. So those are things yeah. at the cellular level, responding to stresses like starvation or radiation or infection. And now Brianna is back and can continue on. Excellent. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Okay. I don't quite know what happened. Um, so yeah, I, you know, we also have the innate immune responses where the cell is maybe making a signal out to others. And so um, I often think about intrinsic immunity as being right on the border between um, that barrier and that innate and sort of, I would sometimes call different parts of it um, one or the other of those. Yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of the times the actions of different interferon-stimulated genes are thought of as being intrinsic immune responses. When we were writing the book, we, I, we always had discussions about this, um, the distinction between intrinsic and innate, because it can be blurred, right? I mean, the, the idea in the book is that intrinsic is there, it's ready to go, and it's cell autonomous, right? And... Um, but there are some things that are there already that are part of the innate <laughs> that are amplified later in innate immunity. So, right, and and a, a good innate immune response turns on some of those intrinsic immune factors. That's right. The problem with this paper is that a number of the things they find are actually innate mechanisms, um, not just intrinsic. So, I, I maybe they're immunologists and they don't care. <laughs> I, I just don't know. But I thought intrinsic is not correct. It should be intrinsic and innate, in my view. But I'm not an immunologist. I'm just a virologist. This sounds like uh, much more a problem with vocabulary than biology. Yeah, no, the, the biology is very clear. And, no, you know, what we what we call things is always weird, right? Because yes, yeah, yeah, it's it's not as though the immune system knows that there are three boxes that it must no, fit exactly. into. No, no. Uh, <laughs> and so the, this distinction is is very, very, very gray. Um, sort of between all of these. But there's some groups. things. There's certainly some things that are there, and there's some things that are induced after sensing, right? That's oh, of course. clear. So I think 
this is both really. So to me, it wouldn't be intrinsic. But if you ask Glenn Rawl, who did, who wrote those chapters, he would, he may be, he might say it is. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. I thought of that and I said, I'm not going to bring it up because then I'll just sound pedantic. So. <laughs> no, but it's a good, yeah, it's a good discussion. So this paper is um, going to, going to examine that. And what they say is that uh, there have been other reports uh, on this uh, issue to distinguish between mild and more severe disease, but uh, most reports have measured host responses in peripheral blood, and maybe that doesn't tell you what's going on in the respiratory tract. So that is what they do here um, and try and figure out not just what kind of host response we have, but um, what kind of cells they actually are. So they have uh, collected nasopharyngeal swabs from 58 patients at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, uh, April, September, 2020. And 35 of these people had a, had a positive PCR nasopharyngeal swab on the day of hospital presentation. They had a control group, 15 people who were asymptomatic and had a negative PCR, six intubated individuals in the ICU without COVID, negative, so these are the negative controls, and then two people uh, with a recent history of, of COVID and a negative PCR. They're, they're classified as convalescent. And these were all given severity scores based on the WHO guidelines, which we'll get into. So you may wonder, they're going to do RNA sequencing on these they're going to extract nucleic acids from the nasopharyngeal swabs and do RNA-seq. And from that, figure out what kind of cell it is and whether it's infected and what kind of immune response it's making. You may wonder how many cells are coming from this. They were able to recover. 57,000 plus or minus 15,000 total cells per swab, which I would never have guessed. I would have guessed 100 cells, right? So uh, that's, a, that's a good number of, of cells. I was you know, startled that they would even get intact cells out of these swabs that would survive yeah. whatever. Uh, and, and they they actually, they comment later on about uh, how the uh, integrity of the cells in the sample could uh, influence the outcome. But nevertheless, they get a lot of intact cells. And importantly, and this just blows my mind. I mean, we're aware of this, but I've I don't think I've ever seen it used to this degree, they're doing single cell yeah. RNA seq. Okay, right. right. So that's that's key. They have a way of out of these swabs, getting uh, essentially isolating single cells and looking at the RNA in each of those single cells. So from the RNA, you can get a, a, a good clue as to what the cell type was. Mm -hmm. You can get a good clue as to what the uh, profile of immune regulated genes is, and you can tell whether or not it's infected. Yeah, <sighs> yeah it's very cool. You need single cells. You're absolutely right. Yes, because that's the whole point of this. And so they got 57,000 single cells from many people, plus or minus 15,000. It's pretty good. Um, I wonder. So when I used the, when I went six times for the COVID test, you know, they, you're by yourself and they have some instructions. Take the swab three times in each nostril. And I used to do six because, I don't know, just the way I am. I thought, <laughs> make sure it's working. Because Amy went once. Amy went once and they say her samples came back, not enough material. So I said, I don't know, I'm going to come back, not enough material. But maybe it's bad to do it six times. I don't know. But maybe well, I have 60, maybe I have 120,000 cells per swab. <laughs> well, and part of me, you know, wonders here what, leads to, you know, that variation. Like if you have a runny nose that day, does that influence yeah. how many cells they get? It might, it might, sure. Anyway, they recovered uh, 32,871 genes across 32,588 cells. And they take all that data and do a lot of computational biology uh, to figure out, you know, what the genes are involved and what what, uh, what kind of cells they are. So they're markers for each kind of cell type in the nasopharyngeal tract, and they can try and figure out what kind of cells they are. And as you'll see later, uh, if they're in really infected or not, and there's not just some RNA stuck on the outside, right? So 
obviously epithelial cells, and there are a whole bunch of different epithelial cells based on markers, um, which you know I'm not going to tell you because <laughs> just they're epithelial cells and they're different. Secretory cells and goblet cells, uh, which they can find as well. Ionocytes, a recently identified subtype of secretory cell, which is involved in regulating mucus viscosity. Did you guys know that about an ionocyte? I didn't. No. No. But it's a cool uh, name, right? You know, I bear, I had to look up uh, uh, mucosal or respiratory epithelium in Wikipedia to even get <laughs> to okay. even get a, a a clue what was going on, and this goes into much more depth than that. What I came what I came away with is that uh, respiratory epithelium. Check me on this. In my sort of naive summary, you got essentially three different types of cells. You got ciliated cells mm -hmm. that move mucus. Then you got cells that make music. Uh, <laughs> music. <sorry. laughs> uh, mucus. <laughs> that includes goblet cells and, and some of these others. So you make mucus and you move it. And this is creates a barrier and, and removes stuff. And then you got cells that are essentially stem cells that regenerate all of these things as they die. And I'm reminded as we go through this of a slide that uh, one of my uh, colleagues used to show who gave flu lectures. Uh, there was a scanning electron microscope of epithelium before and after an influenza infec infection. <laughs> and before you see all of this, uh, all of these cilia, okay? And mm -hmm. after the influenza infection, they're all gone. Okay. Yeah, so right. flu just kills all those ciliated cells yep. and they have to be regenerated. And that's one of the reasons <clears throat> that you wind up with. Uh, that's part of the respiratory uh, symptomology mm -hmm. is that you're not moving, moving the mucus anymore. Good title. You make mucus and you move it. <laughs> <laughs> ciliated cells, squamous cells are another, but ciliated cells are the most numerous in your uh, nasopharyngeal tract. Okay. So remember that. They also find uh, some lymphoid cells, T cells, B cells. They find macrophages, dendritic cells, plasmacytoid dendritic cells, some mast cells. So yeah, you got them all. And they say from each person, we get different cells, uh, but it's variable from person to person um, uh, between distinct individuals. So they looked... They looked at some of the uh, host proteins that are needed for infection, like the receptor ACE2, high expression among secretory cells and goblet cells, to a lesser extent in ciliated cells. I don't know what that means, frankly, because I don't know that a, that range of protein production really matters for virus infection. I don't think anyone has looked at that. Well, Ten this isn't even telling us protein production. It's telling us RNA. Yeah, it's RNA even. Yeah, who knows? Um they look at the tempress proteases, furins. Uh, this is RNA again. Uh, tempress 2, which is a cell surface protease that can cleave uh, the spike, which is required for, for fusion and entry. Highest abundance in squamous cells, modest elsewhere. Just cathepsins is the, are the um, endosomal proteases that also can cleave spike are found in a variety. I, I don't know what any of this means, frankly, because... As Brian said, it's RNA. And even if it were protein, I still wouldn't know what it meant. Um, there, there was a little bit of the bioinformatics that caught my attention that <clears throat> I can't say I understand, but just tells you the sort of sophistication that we're looking at here. This uh, phrase, we applied single cell RNA velocity, <laughs> SC velo. <laughs> in parentheses, which leverages RNA splicing dynamics to infer developmental trajectories. So they're not just looking at what genes are there. They can look at splicing patterns. Yeah. Okay. And that gives them an idea of what, uh, what these things are doing, I guess, in time developmentally. Mm-hmm. That's what I took away from that. So, I mean, the the uh, the level of sophistication of the bioinformatic analysis is just 
awe-inspiring. I just don't know what it means, though, because no, you know. I, I can't. I, there's a lot of there's a lot of this a lot of these data that I can't evaluate. Yeah. I have to take them at their word, and I also uh, think that you know it would be interesting to get a computational biologist on who could look at some of this stuff and say, uh, okay, well, you know, how how true is this stuff? Okay, because you got a uh, you, you got a whole bunch of Mm, uh, ideas about how to interpret the data. Okay. Sure. And I don't know, I don't know how valid a lot of that stuff is. Well, I think, I, I think a lot of the details that you're mentioning, the two different kinds of ciliated, I, I, I'm not sure they make any claim for that, but the big picture conclusions, are, yes. which we'll get to are probably okay. Right? Yeah. Right. Exactly. All right, so they, as I said, they can score these patients uh, by disease severity and their, their WHO numbers like zero or healthy controls. Uh, the seven to eight are PCR negative intubated patients. One to five are PCR positive mild disease. Six to eight is severe disease. Okay. Um, what's interesting, the abundance of ciliated cells is significantly reduced among the six to eight participants, that's positive, PCR positive severe disease. They had 21 of those. Silly, as, as Rich said, for flu, they're trashed for SARS-CoV-2 also, right? Also, um, deuterosomal cells are increased <laughs> among seven to eight, which are the controls. Okay, those are the controls. Secretory cells is also increased among the zero, which are healthy in seven to eight. I had to look up deuterosomal, right. not to be confused with deuterostomal. <laughs> um, and uh, my my uh, my takeaway from what I read was that these are cells that are destined to become ciliated cells. Okay, they're in the process of making, trying to make cilia. Um, uh, so it kind of makes sense that if mm -hmm. you trash the ciliated cells, that there's a response that tries to replace them. Got it. So you guys, I had one question as I was reading through all of this. Mm. And, and that was really about kind of the sampling technique and how much of this do we, you know, are, are we getting cells that are per, perhaps particularly fragile and particularly more likely to be shed yeah. versus the cells that are present? And so is this telling us about cell presence or cell shedding um, in some of these cases? And I, I know so little about this that I can't assess that. That's a good point. Um, whether but it's something that I've wondered. Yeah, whether you're taking with the swab preferentially cells that are about to come off anyway, right? Or right. dislodging. I just don't know either. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they raised that issue in their, uh, what things that might be wrong with this paper. There's a nice way of saying <laughs> Caveats. <laughs> Caveats. Caveats. Limitations. Have, yeah, limitations. That's it. They have a, yeah, they have a section on, uh, on limitations and they mention that and also, uh, whether or not the cells that they do recover survive the sampling and how all yeah. that might yeah. affect their yep. results. So those are, those are important issues. All right, let's see. Now they go through some more ACE2 stuff that I don't want to cover because I don't really know what that means. Um, okay. Among COVID recipients, decreased proportions of ciliated cells, two subsets of ciliated cells, which are the most differentiated cell types. So this is consistent with we, this whole idea that the ciliated cells are going down is particularly pronounced among individuals with severe disease, suggesting that the overall reduction... Um, preferentially affects terminally differentiated subsets. Among individuals with mild, moderate COVID, we find an increase in the proportion of interferon responsive ciliated cells, 15.9% compared to less than 1% among healthy controls. So the healthy, the moderate, mild are responding, uh, interferon responsive. Uh, how about the immune cells? Among the immune cells, macrophages markedly increase in abundance during severe COVID. 
And rare plasma cytoid DCs and mast cells are over 1% of immune cells only among the COVID patients in all. It's interesting that the macrophages are just in the severe are markedly increased. Um, so how does this, uh, how does the transcriptional pattern correlate with disease severity? The largest transcriptional changes are observed within the epithelial compartment. When comparing mild, moderate to severe, we found multiple cell types show robust transcriptional changes more drastically among ciliated cell types. Cells from both mild, moderate, and severe operated regulated genes involved in the host response to virus. And these include a lot of interferon-induced uh, genes and as well MHC1 and 2. And, and things that are involved in antigen processing and, and presentation. Uh, large sets of interferon responsive and antiviral genes are exclusively induced among ciliated cells um, from the mild uh, group compared to controls. Cells from individuals with mild moderate disease show strong upregulation of diverse antiviral factors. When compared to cells from healthy people, cells from individuals with severe COVID did not significantly induce type 1 or type 2 interferon responsive genes. So that's not good, right? Severe COVID, right. you're not turning on all these interferon responsive genes, which would be useful in protecting you from infection, right? Right. And the, the virus has some ways of um, interfering with the interferon response. And so maybe we're seeing you know, more interference going on in those patients for some reason. Yeah, I, I think um, at, at some point they say that there's a, it's a combination of the virus doing some antagonism, plus probably these people with severe COVID have some polymorphisms, some polymorphisms that dampen their innate responses, right? And the combination yep. of the two is really bad, essentially. Um, and that's been suggested by other previous studies, right? That yes. people with severe COVID have a range of issues in many of these uh, sensors or, or uh, interferons and so forth. Um, let's see here. Oh, one, one, is, one thing that's interesting that they looked at. So there's been some suggestion that some people with severe COVID make an antibody against their interferons couple of reports about that. So they, they looked at that for, they looked for antibodies to uh, interferon in plasma that was collected from these patients at the same time as the swab. And they found IgG autoantibodies targeting interferon omega and alpha in one of eight participants with severe COVID and none with mild disease, none of the healthy donors. And they say, I think this is funny, we cautioned against generalizing this result. <laughs> Due to our limited cohort size. Yeah, one. One out of eight is not generalizable, I think. But they say about 10% of severe individuals with autoantibodies to interferon components have been published already. So that's interesting, right? What's the, Brian, you have any insight into autoantibodies against interferon? What's going on there? You know, I don't. And, I, you know, the, the controversy here, I mean, the idea is that you have these autoantibodies, they neutralize interferon. And so then it's like you didn't make an interferon response at all. Yeah. Um, the question that has been sort of raging is, are you a person who had those antibodies beforehand? Yeah. Um, yeah. And thus we're having a, a reduced interferon response or did this infection somehow make you start making those antibodies? And there's some debate on that front. Um, I think that one of the things that to me was really fascinating about this was when I was reading those papers about those uh, patients with those antibody responses, mm. um, they talk about how those patients have existed and, you know, it seems like they don't have problems with some certain other viruses. Yeah. Um, mm. and, and so I just found that whole mm. thing fascinating. Uh, the, this now next part I found interesting. They looked at, transcription factors that are important in the uh, induction of interferon-induced genes, IRF1, 9, STAT1, and 2. Nearly everyone who developed se severe disease failed to induce these 
transcripts for STAT 1, 2, IRF 1, and IRF 9. These are really important. Um, and they say even individuals who had milder disease but later went on to develop severe disease already had diminished STAT 1 at the time of the nasal swab. So they say maybe STAT 1 it might be a predictor of a poor outcome, right? Because you're not going to go on to make the ISGs that you need. The, uh, the next part of the paper deals with looking at the, um, the virus. Um, and they actually did total um, sequence, sequence analysis to look for other viruses. And they found no other viruses infecting these individuals except SARS-CoV-2. And they say, all right, the people with severe COVID had higher amounts of viral RNA in the terms of reads, right? So this is not infectious virus. And people with mild disease had fewer reads. Um, the secretory cells seem to be the ones that have the most viral RNA associated with them. Um, they do a long series of explanations to say why we think these are actually virus infected because, you know, just looking for reads is not enough, but they actually find some negative strand RNA. They find some, uh, uh, some transcripts and some some indications of the uh, the splicing that's going on, so they think that at least some of these are truly viral infected. And they say the majority of RNA positive cells are ciliated, goblet, secretory, or squamous cells. So those are the more differentiated parts of that epithelium, and excluded from that are the basal cells that are the sort of precursors to all of those guys. They seem to be specifically uh, excluded. A high proportion of interferon-responsive macrophages had material in them. Uh, they suspect maybe they have just engulfed a virus-infected cell or a virus particle. Um, and again, developing ciliated cells have the highest RNA molecules per cell. The interferon responsive cells have the lowest per cell abundance of RNA. And they say maybe that's because the, <laughs> they're interferon responsive and that's curbing viral reproduction. All right. And then how about some other uh, genes um, that are involved in clearance? They look at others, um, I, IFITs and MX and IRFs and so forth. Uh, these are all upregulated now in virus, what they consider to be virus infected cells. We saw before that they were upregulated in general in certain cell types, but now they say these are specifically upregulated in uh, virus infected cell cells. Um, IFID-M3 and IFID-M1 in particular, they see repeated and robust upregulation. Um, now this is interesting because I'm thinking what I know about those, they they interfere with membranes and they can disrupt endocytosis, endocytic entry of virus. But they say here that they can actually facilitate entry by, entry by beta coronaviruses. Uh, and so maybe they think maybe that this is being uh, used to facilitate infection. They also see genes uh, for lipid and cholesterol biosynthesis upregulated, which makes sense in uh, cells infected with envelope viruses and also RNA viruses, which use the, they build membranes to reproduce their RNA on. Um, antiviral factors were largely absent from presumptive virally infected cells who developed severe COVID. And in particular, PKR, <laughs> the gene for PKR, EIF2 alpha kinase 2, which encodes PKR, which, and that, senses double-stranded RNA drives apoptosis and translational inhibition. Uh, that is hardly upregulated in patients with severe COVID. And it is in the mild. It's amazing, right? So not only the stats are not upregulated, but PKR is not. And this is a really important um, antiviral gene. So Yeah, and I think some of their reasoning behind using that intrinsic uh immune response in their title is because of they're looking at these in the cells that are infected versus not. I think that that's their reasoning. I'm not going to say I love uh, it. Okay, whatever. But, 
but uh, yeah, the, the conclusions still hold, I guess. Yeah. Um, so neither PKRG nor interferon responsive uh, factors, which I said stat one and two are expressed within infected cells from severe COVID patients. And they say, this suggests a failure of the intrinsic immune response among nasal epithelial cells in individuals who develop severe COVID-19. So, but shouldn't what? that just be a failure of innate response? I mean, if we yeah, think yeah, that could be. PKR is an interferon stimulated gene, then I, I think yeah. it's yeah. both. I think it's right at, yeah, it's both really. Because PKR is around, right? But it is also an in, in, uh, interferon stimulated, absolutely. Right. And, and many okay. of the other, the IFITs are all interferon stimulated genes, right? Yeah, well, and that's the exact line that I always think is a fishy line with intrinsic versus immune. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> I just, I would have said intrinsic and innate in the title, but yeah. it's fine. Yeah. It's fine. So that's the story. I think you, you get to see, it's a cool technology. You get to see the kinds of cells that are infected and the kinds of responses they make and really some diff interesting differences between uh, moderate and severe disease. Um which uh, they say, as I said before, these these patients probably have some inborn defects, which have previously been shown in TLR3, IRF7, IRF9, IFNAR1, uh, and probably that combined with um, a little bit of antagonism from uh, the viral genome uh, may be enough to give you severe COVID. Yeah, you, you kind of wonder whether, you know, because this is a tug of war, usually, with... Viruses and cells. The mm. viruses have, you know, uh, make functions to counter the intrinsic and innate immune response. Mm -hmm. And you have uh, the intrinsic and innate immune response. And so uh, what determines who wins? Well, obviously, if you are uh, deficient or somehow genetically uh, compromised in some of those uh, intrinsic or innate immune responses, the viruses, uh, the virus is going to have an advantage. Yeah. But I wonder what other, what other factors, what other circumstances surrounding the infection might tip the balance in the favor of the virus. Uh, and once the virus gets yeah. rolling, uh, be able to suppress that response and take off. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm just speculating. I'm sure there are others. Absolutely. Maybe, yeah, no, I'm absolutely sure there are others too. If you, maybe but, if you uh, had a poor night's sleep, you know. <laughs> yeah, if nothing else, this uh, uh, really highlights the importance of that innate intrinsic response. Because when that, under circumstances where that is robust, that's associated with mild disease. Yeah. yeah. So the other thing that I found sort of interesting when looking at these data was that there wasn't this big um, signal coming from things like IL-6 um, and some of those and yeah. so they, they talk a little bit about some of the chemokines, but the inflammatory cytokines that everyone you know talks about is the cytokine storm that is causing so many problems don't really show up here. Yeah. Um, part of that is they, they mentioned that one type of immune cell, the granulocytes, which includes neutrophils, didn't really make it through their, their uh, mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they can't look at a neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio or any of those things that we were talking about at the beginning here, because they don't really have yeah. a lot of neutrophils. Yeah. And so me, so that's one thing that I think was missing here. Um, you know, and cause those are cytokines people are talking about yeah. having mm -hmm. some important role clinically and they don't show up here much at all. Um, cause I, I was being my immunologist geek self who wanted to dig into some of the, you know, specific transcripts. And it was interesting to me to actually not see that and to see how important the interferon side of this is. Obviously virologists know interferon is kind of important, um, but it was neat to kind of see it without some of those others. There are two things here in the discussion that I, I missed over in the results. So first, the, the patients with severe COVID, they see unique recruitment of highly inflammatory macrophages, which are the sources of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, so I, I forgot to, to point that out. They also say there is specific upregulation of alarmins, which is another great name. Uh, these um, have been recently identified as potential biomarkers of severe COVID and may drive excessive inflammation. So that's, that's interesting. And n secondly, I missed... They find SARS-CoV-2 RNA-positive cells only express 
MHC1 and poorly express MHC2 compared to matched bystanders. And they say, to our knowledge, downregulation of pathways for antigen presentation by coronas has not been previously described. I forgot to mention those. I missed them. Too, too much highlighting. You know, sometimes you have too much highlighting and then you miss it. So uh, part of what I come away with in this is also, now they were just looking at respiratory epithelium, but I, I come away with this idea that uh, that's sort of the, the frontier of the infection. And that's where uh, the, you know, that first battle uh, in, you know, what I'm picturing as a war is what's gonna sort of determine who gets the upper hand. Uh, whether it's you or yeah. or, or the yeah. virus. Yeah, um, I think that's correct. I think what happens early on really determines the outcome, right? So the, that leaves two questions. One, uh, can you use any of this information uh, in, a, in a prognostic fashion for a person who shows up with COVID? Mm -hmm. uh, and number two, can you use it in a therapeutic fashion? I don't have answers to either of those. Okay, are there are there therapies, Brianne, that can target the uh, uh, intrinsic or innate immune system to to make sure, or or are we? I mean, so far, what we've got is you know antibody cocktails, which is <laughs> you know another uh, uh, you're treating the virus itself. You're not really looking at the uh, intrinsic or innate uh, immune response. But is there anything that can be done using this therapeutically? Um, so there are a couple of things, although they're all rather uh, experimental. Um, and so the one that sort of has the best data behind it is a small molecule that can trigger um, a type 1 interferon response through an alternate pathway. Um, and so if you're not making enough of the type 1 interferon response, the sting agonist um, can actually sort of go around um, the pathway that normally would make this type one interferon and help you get some additional type one interferon. Um, there are a couple of papers about that, um, but nothing that's sort of being used that we use frequently in the clinic. I think this is part of the reason why so many of us like to study this process and try to figure out exactly those things. Um, I, I look at this and think about, is there a way that you can deliver antigen to different anatomic locations that might give you a response that gives you the upper hand? Um, but it, targeting the intrinsic or innate immune response is where many of us would like to go. Well, there is a way you can deliver antigen to give you an upper hand. That's get vaccinated, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, can, but can we alter the vaccine design so that it, it might give you an even better immune response? Yeah, that's a good question, Rich. I, I think it, we don't know. We can't, because you could get everyone's genome sequence, say, oh, you have all the SNPs that are involved but that may not be the whole story, right? There may be yeah. other things. And I don't know how to treat people, especially if people show up, can't breathe, or I think it's too late, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the other problem is that interferon, like many parts of the immune system, sort of has this Goldilocks issue where too little is a problem, but too much is a problem too. And so how do you get the right amount at the right time in the right place? Yep. So the, the You'd like to be able to, when somebody comes into the clinic and they're infected, You'd like to be able to maybe use some kind of information like this to say, okay, well, what, where are you on this path? Mm -hmm. Okay. And are you going, are you going uh, on a, on a downhill trend or are you, have you got the upper hand? Okay. And use that to help you tailor therapies. I, you know, I don't know <laughs> you're going to do single cell RNA seq on everybody who comes into the clinic. I don't think so. But who knows, 20 years from now, maybe so. But Plus no, you'll have in 20 genome years, sequence. 20 years, 20, the genome sequence will be done at birth, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then you pull right. it up on your computer. Oh, you have this stat one issue. Yeah, we're yeah. going to give you something. Yeah. But what that is. So they, their last sentence is good. They say, um, the, the, what controls infection and, and may enable progression to severe disease. The causes may be rooted in human diversity, yet they converge on impaired intrinsic immunity in nasal epithelial cells. And then they say, Rich, it suggests there may be a clinical window in which severe disease can be subverted by focused preventative or therapeutic interventions early within the nasal pharynx. What do you got in mind? <laughs> I don't know what you're thinking. And who gets there early enough? That's the problem, right? 
if you are not feeling, if you're feeling fine, a little scratchy throat cough, you're not going to go seek help until it's later. So that's part of the problem, right? Uh, this, in terms of uh, getting on top of this early, mm -hmm. remember the lick a stick days? I was just thinking that. Yes, I was so thinking that. So my daughter, mm -hmm. Sarah, I'm so proud of this. She is currently in London lighting the revival of Jersey Boys. Yeah, cool. <laughs> um, and she had to go through quarantine. Mm -hmm. uh, she spent six days uh, in quarantine that involved uh, uh, testing before she left, uh, testing a couple of times when you get, when she got there, all officiated and ta uh, taken care of by the National Health Service. Okay. And uh, then after that, and this is, I think, facilitated by the National Health Service, but not required uh, through the production staff at Jersey Boys. And I think that the National Health Service makes this sort of thing available to people who are running operations mm -hmm. like this. Uh, she takes a, uh, a rapid antigen test every day. Yeah, perfect. Okay, and then the, the NHS... Uh, she uh, she is supplied with these uh, kits by the NHS that are a seven day supply of swabs. Great, and it's a a, a quick test and uh, takes her thirty minutes. And um, uh, the test even comes with a QR code on the testing thing, so you can report your results to NHS if you want. Nice. All right. Uh, so that's. You know, that's, that's a possibility. Uh-oh, I'm positive. I'm yeah. going to go in and find out what my innate, uh, <laughs> no, that's part uh, innate of it. intrinsic immune status is, and we'll figure out what no, to do. That's absolutely, rapid, cheap testing is absolutely essential for a lot of people. Now, Daniel also talks about he's helping um, TV test people every day, right? Set up testing schemes, and that's what you need to do. And if you get a positive, then... Yeah, you could think about early intervention, but if you're not and you wait till you're not breathing, you can't. Yeah. You're done. All right. Let's uh, just do a couple of emails here. Uh, <clears throat> Kathy, can you take the first one? Sure. Lisa and David Wright, Vincent Allen, Dixon, and Brianne. We have spent the past week working toward COVID-19 mitigation strategies in our community, and I just flipped on Sunday's TWIV. Today is Wednesday. Not surprisingly, Tennessee was one of your topics. You'll be <laughs> glad to know that your opinions are respected and shared by the professionals in our county. Tennessee has an interesting state health department reach. While smaller counties follow the direction of the state, counties including Hamilton, where we live in Chattanooga, can follow the directives of the local health department. The Chattanooga Hamilton County Health Department is proudly continuing to advise childhood vaccination and vaccination against COVID-19 and has had two such events in the past week. As far as our strategies go, we continue to advise the county mayor and schools, plus Purdue University and our other schools and businesses, and are taking the Delta variant seriously. 100% of sequencing done locally is the Delta variant, and hospitalizations are following the same curve as Springfield right now. Thanks for continuing to educate us all. Without you, we couldn't do our job. As always, we believe it can be done, School, work, you name it. And vaccination along with basic mitigation is our strategy. Your friends in Chattanooga, Lisa Smith and David Bruce. So we had them on TWIV ooh, hmm. a year ago, <laughs> last summer sometime. Uh, so yeah. this is in response to my pick on Friday, which mm -hmm. was about Tennessee. And I thought afterwards, I wonder what they're doing because they're all pro prevention and vaccination. So I'm yeah. wondering how they're, and so obviously they're pockets of <laughs> resistance, yeah. right? Yeah. It's we have 656, August 23rd, 2020, titled C, It Can Be Done. Oh, it's a year mm -hmm. ago. Really great conversation with the two of them. Wow. Yeah. Talking about a multifaceted approach to uh, basically non-pharmaceutical interventions to controlling the uh, outbreak. Uh, let me take Rebecca's here because this is... Uh, my fault. Speak, Rebecca writes, speaking of pilots being supremely calm, I, I have a little story. I remember years ago hearing the recording of a pilot who was watching another plane have a disaster in the air. 
The plane was obviously going to crash, and the pilot described it as calmly as if he were placing an order at Starbucks. Remembering that actually makes me feel better when I'm on a plane that my pilot won't freak out if something goes wrong. <laughs> okay. Brienne. Heat writes, Twivster. <laughs> <laughs> I have been listening for about five years, but there has never been a better episode than 773. Everything Lori said was spot on. I should not have been surprised that you gave her a platform. You can lose me in jargon, but you cannot fool me. You are the real science deal. Many thanks, Pete. And Pete is, of course, uh, referencing the episode about Lori Garrett. Have we ever had Lori Garrett? Uh, Rich. Ryan writes, greetings. I'm writing from Silver Springs, Maryland, where it's 28 degrees C, and I'm impatiently waiting to start my junior year studying cell biology and genetics at UMD College Park. In TWIV 777, you read a letter about the negative comments on the CDC COVID posts on Facebook. And frankly, your incredulous reactions to the false claims were uh, kind of adorable. Uh, you really are just a bit naive to the level of madness that exists out there, aren't you? Uh, I have to say, as an aside, that uh, I find it, uh, there has to be a way to uh, suppress, uh, have no comments. And I'm astonished the CDC doesn't do that because it's crazy. Oh, so I, do you want an answer on that? Yes, please. Uh, I spoke to my college roommate who is a lawyer uh, about this, who now listens to TWIV. Um, and she says they can either have them completely off or completely on, but they cannot moderate. Um, because right. of freedom okay. of speech. So turn them completely off. Yeah. You know, they don't need, they don't need comments on that stuff. It's just information. Right. <clears throat> okay. Well, I'm familiar with those CDC posts and such, and I have had the fortunate experience of talking to a cousin who's been exposed to this misinformation. He happens to be sharp enough to listen and understand, but the information he's been exposed to is awful. The conversation was illuminating for both of us, and I thought I'd share some of the common myths with you guys. So there's a several, there's four bullet points here with different myths. One, uh, the mRNA vaccines aren't actually vaccines. This one I've seen a lot, and it confused the hell out of me. According to my cousin, he was told that all vaccines must contain the actual pathogen, either inactivated or attenuated. <laughs> the myth was easy to dispel by explaining subunit, viral vectors, etc. I didn't have to bring up mRNA vaccines. Two, the inventor of PCR says it shouldn't be used to detect COVID. That's a weird one, huh? But I've seen it before. I guess people are claiming that it's not a diagnostic tool. I don't know the origin of that claim, but I explained what a ubiquitous tool PCR is and how long it's been around. Has, Three. Ha, wait, before you go on, has yeah. anybody heard anything from Kerry Mullis lately? Has he? Has he, he, he actually anything? did. It was a while ago, though. Okay. I'm going to Google it, what he said, but. Okay. This is the inventor of yes. PCR. <laughs> Who is kind of out there on the bell-shaped curve, <laughs> <laughs> shall we say. Yes. Uh, I'll go on while you're Googling, Brianne, okay? Okay. Uh, PCR is just a copy machine, so you can find anything. Another strange thing is floating around. This is harder to dispel because you have to find a person willing to listen to a summary of how PCR works. I've also seen people online misunderstand what CT, CT values are and claim that actual quote, experts play games with them to manipulate the results. I guess both of those about PCR are uh, under the general umbrella of uh, COVID is a hoax, okay? So uh, these uh, PCR is not actually detecting uh, something that's gonna cause you a problem. Uh, last one, mRNA vaccines are gene therapy, probably the most common one. In, my, in fact, my cousin specifically heard that they modify mitochondrial DNA. Another difficult myth to dispel because even though it's pretty basic, it's still cell biology. Distrust and or impatience halts discussion of anything remotely technical. 
I thought you might find some of that interesting. It's often the case that people will encounter snippets of scientific facts or terminology and be unable to contextualize them, giving rise to myths. Exactly. Okay. It's little bits of science that get spun uh, out of control in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, that's the nature, that's the fundamental nature of pseudoscience. Uh, but finding those willing to learn the context is rare. Too bad they don't listen to TWIV. Yours, Ryan R. Thank you, Ryan, nice. and good luck with your uh, schooling. Good. So I have done my Googling. Okay. Um, there is a quote that is misattributed to him, but the basic idea is that PCR does not detect infectious virus um, in his quote. Um, that it's, and it is a research tool, not a diagnostic tool. But of course, he could not have said any of this about COVID-19, given that he died in 2019, um, before this <laughs> pandemic started. <laughs> Oh, I miss that fact. Um, which also, if you if you do the Googling um, to try to find out about this one, there is a post that comes up pretty quickly that says, um, and he died mysteriously right before the pandemic. Um, I'm not quite sure how mysterious it was, but. She wasn't that old. Hmm. No. Oh, well. Um, uh, let me take this next one. <laughs> Michael writes, the other day I asked my Fire TV to take me to your YouTube channel, but Amazon speech analytics could not parse rack and yellow. <laughs> you can probably guess what Amazon came up with from the attached. Anyway, I thought it might be a fun little mascot avatar. And uh, Michael sent a picture of a um, raccoon because it came up with Vincent Raccoon Yellow. Mm. That's cute. <laughs> that is cute. Maybe you have to use that as a show image. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Kathy. <coughs> Kathy. All right. Dear Vincent and Twiv team, longtime listener, first time writer. Thank you for your sanity and science over the past year and a half. I don't know how I would have made it through this far without Twiv. And keeping up with your updates and myth debunking have helped me combat misinformation and misunderstandings in my own circles. I'm willing to share a recent bright spot for me. I live in Japan, where the vaccination rollout has been unnecessarily slow, and a media focus on reactogenicity over effectiveness has further fueled hesitancy in some demographics. However, I was pleased to see that my local government's newsletter to residents, distributed free of charge in every mailbox, was factual, balanced, and did a great job of addressing concerns in a reassuring manner. I'm attaching a photo of the back page of the newsletter, which gently takes aim at the biggest worries, complete with cute graphics and accurate but accessible phrasing. The main clipboard graphic is titled about the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. The left column addresses reactogenicity, which is the term they used, not quote, side effects. <laughs> it spells out what might happen that the second shot often hits harder and notes that almost all recipients are back to their usual selves in a day or two. It does also list when to call to get medical advice, fever persisting more than two days, extreme symptoms, etc., and lists the 24-hour phone line to contact to report anything unusual. The right column defines and explains anaphylactic reactions, but makes clear they are rare, can be treated immediately, and that there are medical personnel standing by after each jab just in case. At the bottom of the column, it even explains the vaccine's 95% effectiveness rate, going so far as to clarify that it does not mean it works in only 95% of the people. The tan box below is a letter from a respected professor at a major medical school in the area and member of the government's tax task force on preventing the spread of SARS-CoV-2. He writes in a friendly and professional manner about the great concerted effort made to create these vaccines, their effectiveness, how the benefits far outweigh the risks of reactogenicity, and why the reactogenicity is in fact a good sign that your immune system is doing what it should. He urges people to get vaccinated for the benefit of society and a return to normal, then finishes by singing the praises of this new, highly effective vaccine type, though he does not specifically mention <laughs> mRNA. The QR code is a link to a video version of his statement for greater accessibility. After all my complaining about how so many governments have handled things so poorly, I was happy to see the local offices in Otoward, Tokyo, doing well and wanted to share a little posit positivity. Thanks again for everything and keep up the good work. Wow. And then he sends a screenshot of this brochure. The only thing where, I... Of course, 
can read in Japanese. The only but. thing I can read is 95%. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Right. Very nice. Number. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Al, for sending that. Appreciate it. Uh, Brienne. Charles writes, hello, Twivers. 91 Fahrenheit, 33 Celsius, 55% relative humidity in Chapel Hill. In other words, hot and sticky, but tolerable when compared to Dr. Honda, Dr. Condit's haunts, past and present. Now that we know more about the fitness of the Delta and Beta variants of SARS-CoV-2, I would like to revisit my position on extending the time between doses for the two-shot vaccines. I had sided with the United Kingdom and others. That puts me at odds with the Twivers, Dr. Fauci, and most importantly, my life partner. That was not a comfortable place to be. <laughs> I am going to defend myself a bit. Times have changed. When the vaccines first got emergency use authorization, there were many arms in search of a vaccine, which is very different from now. Next, the Moderna vaccine, and by extension, the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, had great protection, 92.1%, two weeks after the first shot. Not too far from the 94.5% two weeks after the second shot. I felt better about my position just a few weeks ago when TWIV reviewed the paper, Extended Interval BNT162B2 Vaccination Enhances Peak Antibody Generation in Older People. For a good, at least from this person, from this lay person's point of view, case for a delayed second dose, see the statement from the BC Center for Disease Control. Um, and we've had quite a few citations um, throughout <clears throat> thus far. Um, okay, that was then and this is now. Instead of arms looking for vaccine doses, we now have vaccine doses looking for arms. Instead of 92.1 versus 94.5, effective vaccines for one versus two doses, we now have 33% versus 88%. I am a hard-headed IT guy, but when circumstances change or we have better data, I am willing to change my mind. It looks like the Brits are changing their mind as well, going from 12 to eight weeks. I will go beyond the Brits and say, stick to their schedule from the phase three studies. Where have I heard that before? One thing that I have not changed my mind about is that for the next pandemic, we need better data about one versus two vaccine doses and what is the best delay. I think the best way to get the needed data and have very fast vaccine development is to have more centralized data monitoring committees and use pooled time matched control groups. I probably should not point this out. I did not admit I was wrong, even in hindsight. At the time, I thought, think both ideas had merit. The epidemiologists will be pouring over the data from the COVID-19 pandemic for decades. I hope we have a better idea of what to do next time. I may not agree with you 100% of the time, but I always find your logic to be excellent and your knowledge to be extremely valuable. Long live the long form scientific podcasts complete with their diversions to stump grinders, snow shovels, manual transmissions, and pet health updates. <laughs> Again, thanks, Charles. Um, and as I said, Charles gives uh, a number of links here. Yeah, it's a well-referenced letter. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, uh, I think you can be... Uh, right both times you know it depends you know circumstances change as you point out yeah and and it's not it's not about being right or wrong it's about you know trying to look at the trying to look at the problem god i saw a great Feynman quote um the other day um i would rather have questions that i can't answer mm. than answers that i can't question yeah yeah that's a good one yeah, I mean, I think that this whole discussion has been a discussion where we've been thinking about things logically and thinking about data, whether, whichever side we're on, whether it's, you know, the side that Charles comes down on or the side that others come down on. And you have to look at a lot of factors. You know, there, there are some pieces of this that, you know, should you get a vaccine or not? I'm not sure we should debate that. But some of these details, I think, make sense to debate uh, based on our current knowledge. I'm not sure that centralized data monitoring committees, blah, 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 is going to happen next time because, I mean, there are individual companies doing each of these clinical trials, right? And I'm not sure that's going to change. You know, there's Pfizer and Moderna and AstraZeneca and J&J, &J, et cetera. So you have to change that. And I don't think that's happening. We need a global uh, medical records, electronic medical records database. Okay. 
Good uh, luck with that. Good luck with that. Yeah. I think we need a global health care system, frankly, but we're not going to ever have that because we can't even get along. <laughs> right? So, but that would make a lot of sense. Maybe not. Maybe it wouldn't make sense because people are so different. I don't know. And it, but for certainly for some of the less fortunate, fortunate companies, uh, countries, it would help a lot, right? Who yeah. to tap into others. Okay, we can finish these off. Rich. Lori writes, hello to my favorite podcasters. I've been listening to past Immune and TWIV episodes and have a few questions. One, Immune episode 16, B is for Bursa, a paper on Merrick's disease in chickens caused by Herpes virus is discussed. Vaccines are given to chickens, yet still 1% to 2% of birds die from infection. The vaccine does not provide sterilizing immunity. A comment is made that most vaccines do provide sterilizing immunity, but from listening to more recent TWIV and immune episodes, I believe that that statement no longer holds, that actually most vaccines do not provide sterilizing immunity. Am I wrong? Can you name some of the vaccines that do provide sterilizing immunity? Okay, so I don't think you're wrong. Uh, this has been a question that we've been bouncing around for a while. Uh, the one vaccine that I am aware of that I believe the experts believe provides sterilizing immunity is the HPV vaccine. Okay. Uh, I don't know about others. Uh, we, you guys, we've talked about this. I think that's the only one I'm aware of. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only one I'm aware of. I've heard debates on either side about measles. Yeah. Um, I believe when Paul Offit came on, he said measles did induce sterilizing immunity. Um, when Sally Permar came on to immune, she said it did not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and in fact, those are two people who I very much respect yeah. um, on these sorts of things. And so, I, I don't have a take home message, though I kind of think it leads towards it does not provide sterilizing immunity. Um, but yeah. HPV is the one that I feel certain about. Uh, by the way, HPV is human papillomavirus. That's the one that's associated with cervical carcinoma. Get the vaccine. Rich, uh, Rich uh, does the smallpox vaccine provide sterilizing immunity? Do you know? I do not know. I don't even know if it's known. That's a good question. Yeah. And, Kathy? and by, the, by the way, um, <laughs> the term sterilizing immunity refers to how complete a protection do you get against the virus uh, infection yeah. and disease right. as opposed to it having anything to do with fertility. Right. Probably not a good term, right? Right. right. Probably not a good <laughs> term. Uh, two, continuing on with uh, Lori's letter. TWIV episode 217, I just flew in and my arms are shot. Uh, from uh, January 2013. Boy, she has been listening to back episodes. In this episode, what causes the seasonality of the flu virus was brought up and how little uh, is understood about it. With our experience over the past year and a half, the thought immediately came into my head that human behavior is probably the big influence, biggest influence on the seasonality of flu. What do you think? Uh, well, that's interesting, in particular in light of the paper that we... Um, mm. Uh, did today. Uh, I uh, I would say, I'm uh, just off the top of my head, that antigenic variation has, uh, well, antigenic variation of the virus, immune variation in the population are probably the two biggest factors, but uh, behavior, I'll bet you, is a factor. Yeah, probably is Good a factor, point. yeah. Yeah. I think population immunity, like we talked about earlier, See, uh, wet weather, right? Humidity, temperature, and so forth. I think they all play a role. Yeah. Three. Do you think the mR uh, that mRNA vaccine advances will help lead to a universal flu vaccine, or will the constant variant change of influenza continue to be an issue? Uh, best regards, Lori. I'll leave that one to others. Though I must say that what comes to mind is that. Uh, there was a pick in my absence that was a couple of lectures on mRNA day mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, the uh, male scientist who presented, whose name escapes Drew me, Drew Weissman, uh, talked about how uh, the mRNA vaccines induce a lot of uh, uh, stock responses in the flu vaccine and how those are cross protective. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, could be the mRNA vaccines uh, in particular, if specifically targeted uh, that way, uh, could be a benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
We'll see. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I would have said is the part of the problem with the flu vaccine is making sure we have the right target. Um, and so if we find discover and are certain about the right target, then we could absolutely use the mRNA vaccines to hit that target. All right, last one, Kathy. Pilgrim writes and sends a link. Over 1,200 doctors and scientists condemn UK COVID-19 policy as, quote, dangerous and unethical. Um, and then I'm not, that's. And that uh, looks like it's a title for his, uh, an article in his link. Yeah. Um, anyway, more than 1,200 scientists and doctors have signed the open letter to the Lancet Medical Journal of July 7th, opposing the UK government's plan for mass infection <laughs> as a dangerous and unethical experiment. Just over 120 experts had signed the letter when it was first published. A week later, that number has increased tenfold. So, Thomas Scripps is the author of the article. Got it. Okay. Okay. Well, we didn't like the idea either a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Not a good idea. All right. Time for some picks. Brianne, what do you have for us? Um, so I have been spending the last few days uh, watching the Olympics. And um, I have an article here called The Science of Swimming that talks about some of the issues regarding force uh, and drag and you know, all of the science behind um, what actually allows uh, swimmers to um, go quickly and how kind of Newton's laws um, tie in. We've got some of the equations here. We've got some information about the power that swimmers are actually uh, producing and things like that. And I just thought it was really interesting to think about the science behind um, all of the great performances we're seeing on TV. Holy cow. This is Neat. It's really red, nerdy. It, it, it is really, it is really nerdy, but at the same time, sometimes you need the really nerdy yeah. stuff. Oh, I'll bet you the swimmers are totally engaged with all of this stuff. Right, exactly. And their yeah. coaches. Yeah, cool. And so cool. it's nice to kind of think about how all of this is being used in you know different. All of the science is being used uh, in a way that you don't usually think about science. Yeah, it's good. It's even got formulas. Nice. Very cool. Kathy, what do you have for us? Um, two picks that have been kind of waiting in the wings because I haven't been here in a while. One is something that is from a while back in the New York Times. It's a, a sort of a, um, almost like a play acting thing where talking to the vaccine hesitant, the, the vaccine hesitant person says something and then you get to choose among several different answers and it, it, you don't necessarily always choose the right ones. And it's interesting because it tells you why saying particular things is, is not the best way to address those concerns. Um, and so I found that really useful, particularly before I started doing some of the vaccine town halls. Hmm. Um, so uh, there's that. And then the second one is um, covidactnow.org. Uh, and this I just happened to get because I wanted to know in my county what was the population of people that had been vaccinated and what was the uh, COVID risk rate? And it gives it to you in really granular detail. You can do it by county or zip code or city. Mm. And I'm having this flashback that maybe I already picked this, but I know I've sent it to a number of people, but I, I don't think I picked it on TWIV. Anyway, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, so, you know, if you're going to be traveling and go to an area where um, you're wondering, you know, how much more risk is there relative to where you live or less risk or whatever. This could be a good way to check that kind of thing out as well. That's and, really, this is really nice. Yeah. And you can set up alerts. So uh, when the risk uh, uh, goes up or down in the area where you've chosen to get alerted about, it it tells you. So I've gotten mm -hmm. alerted a couple of times that the risk in Michigan has gone up. Yeah, I, I was going through looking at the bots answers when talking to the vaccine hesitant. It's <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Massachusetts has the second highest percentage, but they have a high risk level now. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting that how the risk and vaccinated goes with political orientation for the most part. Yeah. Isn't it terrible? Yeah. <sighs> That's cool though. Rich, what do you have for us? So I have a publication from the Center for Countering Digital Hate uh, called The Disinformation Dozen, Why Platforms Must Act on 
12 leading online anti-vaxxers. Uh, and I looked this up because uh, probably many people have seen uh, stated in the you know mainstream media mm. over the last few weeks uh, this uh, idea uh, or observation that uh, somewhere, between, depending on how you count it, somewhere between 65 and 75 percent of the misinformation that's out there on uh, social media uh, can is traceable to just 12 people. Um, and uh, I've always wondered where that came from. Uh, and I finally uh, saw, was reading one of these articles and it linked to this, and this is where it came from. So the organization, as I said, is called the uh, uh, Center for Countering Digital Hate. And it deals with much more than just um, COVID. It deals with all sorts of, uh, you know, trash on the internet and trying to uh, counter it. And I give a wiki link here so you can uh, look up and see what that uh, organization is all about. It looks uh, quite legitimate. Uh, and the report is a pretty easy read. Um, and uh, it actually fingers who the uh, disinformation dozen are and uh, details uh, some of their more egregious uh, offenses. Uh, and so let me see, I want to find, um, I wanted to find, uh, oh, that's number 11. Let's go back. The, the guy at the top of the list, I just want to cite him actually <laughs> one and two. Um, sorry, yeah. here we go. Guy at the top of the list is a guy named Joseph Mercola. Yeah, yeah. Uh, successful anti-vax entrepreneur peddling dietary supplements and false cures as alternatives to vaccines. God. Mercola's confined personal social media accounts have around 3.6 million followers. And one of the important things about this is that these guys are making money off this. Yeah. Big money. Yep. Okay. And that's as much as anything else, I presume, their motivation. Uh, they get, you know, they get people who donate to them. Uh, they get uh, invitations to speak places, and I'm sure they uh, raise a lot of money that way. And quite a few of them are in the alternative uh, medication business. So they are profiting uh, off of other people by promoting uh, disease and death in other individuals. And of course, number two is our old buddy, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, so... Uh, and then you can go on down the line and there's a bunch of um, individuals, shall we say, in here involved in this and you can read all about it. And uh, the Center for D uh, Digital Hate also uh, has a, you know, uh, cites the uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram for not taking uh, better action on this and cites methods that they should use to approach this. Uh, about a month later, this was back in March, about a month later, they followed up with a sequel uh, that says that uh, a little bit of progress had been made, but not much. So I think this is important to understand uh, and important to uh, hopefully do something about in the future. This is, this is horrible that these people kill people and they just yep. have no remorse. And Facebook and Twitter, whoever else propagates their stuff, just... They should just ban it as they ban it. And it would also be interesting to know if they themselves are vaccinated. Probably are. Uh, these individuals, yeah. Mm -hmm. where, did, where did I read? the Some governor of a state who, that does not promote vaccination himself got vaccinated but would not publicize it, of course. Right, yes. <sighs> yeah, and, and Rich, the, the statement about money it just reminds me of the uh, quote, you know, I don't know what the question is, but the answer is always money. Yep. <laughs> so uh, just to uh, emphasize while we're on the topic, it may be obvious, but uh, if everybody were vaccinated, we wouldn't be having a problem. Nope. Uh, that is that is the answer. And I also, I don't know if this is true, but I suspect that some of those who are not being vaccinated, if they think about it at all, uh, with any sort of reasoning, might be figuring that this will blow over ultimately, uh, and that they can then go about in the world unvaccinated and be okay. Not true. 
<laughs> the virus is not going away. The probability that you will get infected may decrease as we emerge from this, but you will always be at risk, always. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Uh, my pick is a um, an article in uh, space.com. So there's this Piers docking port, which has been on this ISS for 20 years. <laughs> and it was put up there originally by Russia. Um, it's it's a docking port. It serves as a port for vehicles arriving and departing so, and, and for doing uh, spacewalks. And this article talks about it. And they recently detached it and it, they sent it to Earth and it burned up. They wanted to get rid of it and replace it with something new. And I just found that fascinating. A deorbit burn. <laughs> and um, that's how they get rid of this stuff. Uh, and then they put a new module up. But I just think it's amazing that it was there for 20 years. It was launched in 2001. And then it was stuck up there and stayed there. And they have some pictures of, of it here and the people crammed into it before they do their spacewalks. I originally found that you may be wondering where, where I get this from. So I follow on Instagram, Asteros, Astero P Space. And they, they had a post on it just the other day. And I, I looked at it and I found it, you know, really cool. This undocking, they have a picture of undocking of the module. Uh, and the uncrewed, this was originally an uncrewed thing. It was always uncrewed. Uh, and then it was um, pushed away and it went and burned out. Um, both the progress and peers, there are two parts of this thing, uh, burned up in the Earth's atmosphere during reentry over the Pacific a few hours after their departure. Farewell, peers and progress, MS-16. So I just think it's, we don't hear much about this. You know, they use things and they throw them back I'm, I'm glad you picked this because I <laughs> uh, saw the headlines and I didn't uh, look into it. So I didn't really know uh, what the ultimate uh, fate of this thing was. So Yeah, they burn good. it up and mm. that works pretty well. And uh, you put a new one on and it makes sense. Mm. So We need to have another conversation with Kate. Sure. Because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it occurs to me that the space station is getting pretty old. They got new modules up there, um, but uh, there's uh, some parts of that that are really yeah. old. And I wonder, yeah. uh, you know, can you keep, you know, what happens to the old bits? Well, this is one of the things that happens. Yeah, well, we could bring her on with the whole crew and uh, chat and talk about gen more general things than just, uh, yeah, sure. Like, uh, yeah, that'd be fun. I'm sure she'd do it. She's back on Earth, right? Yeah. That sounds so fun. We have a listener pick from April. Uh, thankfully, the smoke has cleared at 28C at 9.30 p.m. I was listening to This Week in Aviation. Ha! <laughs> we were talking about <laughs> planes a few weeks ago. I have more cool aviation picks. My friends at the local Georgia airport, Feltz Field, Addison Pemberton, and his family and friends have restored 16 airplanes over the past 20-ish years and gives two links for that. Thanks for all the good info and fun. And there wow. you go. Very this cool. is a real, this is quite an effort. Yeah. Holy cow. Not a cool planes. Um, Feltz Field is listed as being in Spokane. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's why she's saying the air's clear. We uh, we drove back through a lot of smoke. Well, maybe. Uh, oh, is GA like general aviation? Maybe. That's what it is. Maybe. I, I, yeah. I figured the it was Georgia. Area. Could... Yeah, SFF. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I knew when I said it, it was going to be wrong. No, it was a, it was a good translation of the abbreviation. Just All right. The right that is TWIV786. Show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. Questions and comments, TWIV at microbe.tv. If you enjoy our work, please support us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. Brian Barker's at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Rich Condit, Emeritus Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. I'm uh, Vincent Racaniello. I had to hesitate for a moment to remember yeah, yeah, think who about I that. was. The other day on Daniel's thing, he said, you know, that's because you don't have a daughter. And I didn't say anything for like 10 seconds. <laughs> no, <laughs> wait, I funny. do. I do.
<laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello, virology.blog or virology.ws. Some people say blog doesn't work. Okay, virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>